Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. It occurred to me I seem to have neglected the war at sea. And whilst we've spent some time in the Pacific, we've not dedicated much time to the Battle of the Atlantic. So in this episode, we're going to be looking at the U-boat threat and the US Navy's air campaign against them. Joining me is Alan Carey. Alan is a historian specialising in military aviation and has written Sighted Sub Sank Same, the United States and Navy Air Campaign Against the U-Boat. But before we get started, this podcast is made possible by the very kind donations of listeners like yourself. The dollar or two that patrons of the show contribute helps me to find the time to put the podcast together purchase research material and pay for the hosting. All so I can produce an hour or two of World War II goodness each month. If you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash ww2podcast or ww2podcast.com and click on donate. When you become a patron of the show, you will get access to more World War II talk from time to time. Often parts of my conversations with guests never make it into the show. They might be off topic, for instance. When I do have some gems, I do make these available to patrons. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast or click on donate at ww2podcast.com. Alan, thanks for joining me. So let's start with something that is perhaps slightly uh, off topic. The war in the Atlantic started in uh, you know, 1939, two years before uh, you know, America enters the war. Um, being neutral, how did America trade with belligerent nations without U.S. shipping becoming, um, becoming a target? And that's why there were neutrality patrols uh, starting right after the Declaration of War in September 1939 is what Ever air assets the U.S. military had at the time, they were used for neutrality patrols to monitor the shipping lanes. Now they couldn't they couldn't uh, directly come in contact with the you know a German submarine, but they would report its position if they found one. It somehow seems not very neutral if you're telling the British that there's a submarine below. Well, it's it's economics. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you, you know, uh, the industrial might of the United States and the Allies sorely needed, uh, especially the British, our, our, you know, our supply chain of all sorts of products from uh, war materials to uh, you know, cereal. Had the American Navy identified this at the start of the war as a potential threat? Right from the start, do they start putting out these anti-submarine patrols? Yeah, as they, uh, as they did in World War One. Naval aviation, they, they would fly patrol aircraft um, around the eastern seaboard, uh, range permitting, uh, on the lookout for, for German submarines. So they had experience with it. They had a history with doing so. So I think it was pretty much a, a, a standard operating procedure that, you know, when World War II began to pretty much do the same type of uh, monitoring uh, as they did. In World War One, it, it's easy to forget that uh, World War One, for so many things, acts acts as a template. You know, if you're just looking at World War Two, you forget that you know they have something to base what might happen on. Obviously, there's a big U-boat threat during during World War One. They can then instantly click on and start thinking uh, thinking that about. Um, to the Germans, when they uh, put in the U-boats to sea, did they put a limiter on? Uh, the waters that they were uh, hunting, they were patrolling in. Did they allow them to go as far over to the uh, U.S.? Well, before the fall of France, most of their bases were, you know, in the far reaches of the Ar Arctic areas. They only had so much range. And then when uh, the, the bases along the French coast became available after the fall of uh, or the armistice with France in 1940, that extended the overall range of the submarines as long with the uh, use of what were called milks cows, which were German submarines that carried a lot of fuel that would go out and meet the submarines or refuel them, extending their ranges even farther 
to, towards the eastern seaboard. Were they actually actively encouraged to go that far? Because it, it strikes me as being potentially asking for trouble, <laughs> being that far over, just, just from a point of view of not wanting to drag the U.S. into the war. They were supposed to not target neutral shipping at all costs. And usually neutral shipping would be, uh, you know, they would, they would have a flag or a flag would be painted upon the, the hull to show its neutrality. And, uh, you know, the Germans based it up on that. All other ships were, you know, fair game. Uh, it wasn't until the U.S. Navy actively started using uh, destroyer escorts and were actively searching for U-boats when the U-boat war with the United States actually happened. It was like a quasi-war before Pearl Harbor, you know, where you had a couple, uh, you know, the USS Greer and the uh, U.S. destroyers actually being attacked by U-boats in, you know, in 1941. This is where King, Admiral King, doesn't he? He, he, he escalates it. That's right, isn't he? He, he? And they are, to all intents and purposes, are they sending these escort ships out to escort convoys? So the British, so were the British escorting them partway across, at which point the US Navy takes over and es escorts them the last leg? Yeah, back and forth from Canada, uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States, to a point to where you know the the British uh, Navy could then take over coverage. Same thing with aircraft. U.S. Army Air Force and the Navy would provide aerial coverage as far as the range of their aircraft. And th then there was that big black hole within the, the the middle of the North Atlantic where it was beyond the coverage of aircraft that was not uh, carrier based. It's, it's like as you say, it's like kind of been at war but not been war. Now there is instances, is there? Isn't there? There's, is it the USS Kearney? Uh, yes, and also the USS Greer. Are they accidentally torpedoed by the by the Germans? They they were identified as U.S. Uh, warships. Uh, here you have a, a basically you have the United States, where public opinion is, is is by far against the war, whereas the 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 Roosevelt administration understands that uh, you know Nazi Germany is a is a great threat to the world. He knows that he cannot directly involve U.S. forces offensively, but that he could uh, you know, somewhat aid the British and uh, the Commonwealth countries in, uh, in, in their war against uh, the German U-boats. And by that nature, you have the, the, uh, the 50 destroyer agreement where the United States uh, handed over 50 World War I class air destroyers to the British in exchange received access rights to islands throughout the Caribbean to operate bases out of. I, I guess it's, you know, post Pearl Harbor, so we're going into 42, when wars, wars declared. Uh, does the U.S. have enough sort of anti-submarine protection to be seriously effective? Because we're getting to the height of the uh, war in the Atlantic at this point, aren't we? Aren't we? They were under strength uh, because most of the uh, naval surface forces were out in the Pacific. So they were very understaffed, under well, undermanned, few ships, very few aircraft uh, available to pose any type of serious threat to, to German U-boat operations. So is the key to the defense for, for, for huge areas that um, those aircraft flying long-range anti-submarine missions? So how, how do they operate? I have visions just, uh, you know, a lot of trying 12 hours with a pair of binoculars and just looking for a glint of a periscope. And, and uh, at first, that was pretty much the uh, anti-submarine warfare tactics. It was a pair of binoculars or searchlights mounted on the aircraft. Um, it wasn't until probably mid-1942 when uh, rangefinders uh, became available to where they could start doing triangulations and, and pinpointing a rough area where submarines were operating. And then by 1942, also uh, more naval aircraft were being equipped with air-to-surface radar sets to even pinpoint the location of uh, surface submarines even more accurately. Is that the H H HFDF, Huffduff? Right, right, right. It was, there was a lag time uh, between, you know, uh, the start of U.S. entries into the war and somewhere around the late spring, early summer, 1942, when, you know, all of the industrial might of the United States started cranking out of more and more aircraft, equipment, additional personnel were being uh, made available. But there was a lag time there for about six to, oh, yeah, about, yeah, about six to eight months 
and that's why you don't see you see very few successes by naval aircraft during 1942. What is the preeminent naval aircraft? Is it the Catalina? At first, it was the Catalina, the PBY Catalina, which was a slow flying aircraft, amphibious aircraft, and then there was the PBM Mariner, uh, which was also uh, you know the flying boat. Then the Navy uh, actually acquired some U.S. Army B-37 Venturas. And that, so that was the primary aircraft used, you know, for the, I would say, the first year uh, of the war until 1943 when the U, uh, U.S. Uh, Navy acquired B-24 Liberator, which they uh, called it the PB-4Y-1 Liberator. Is that the, the, the navy firing it? We call it the P- PBY. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they had to call it PB-4Y, yeah, so... <laughs> they so the, the, you know like the Catalina, it, it, and I guess most of these near, these um, uh, flying boats, they're fantastic long range, but you know they're 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 relatively slow. They're not really attack aircraft. Did they have offensive capabilities, or was it just their job to try and call in the surface ships? The naval air crews flew them as offensive platforms, defensive armament. Armament basically considered of a uh, 30 caliber machine gun in the no, in a nose turret, and uh, single 50 caliber uh, machine guns in the side blisters, and they carried external bomb racks that carried depth bombs, 325 pound, primarily depth bombs, and they would use that to actually attack the submarine using the machine guns to try to. Uh, drive down any type of defensive fire coming from the German submarine. Then they would come in at probably between, I'd say, 50 to 200 feet on average and drop a string of uh, uh, depth bombs. 50 feet doesn't sound very high in a, in a big rolling Atlantic swell, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been to know that somewhere else. I thought, crikey, that's not for that. You must be kissing the top of the waves as you're coming in at that uh, at, at these with these lights. <laughs> oh, yes, I mean, it depend. It, it actually is dependent upon the uh, uh, the pilot, or in the navy, it was patrol plane commander. Uh, you know, and you had certain pilots would bomb at two hundred, and some were crazy enough to bomb at fifty feet. Did the U boat have much? I mean, I know against much defense against aerial attack. I mean, I know often they had a, a gun on deck, but how effective is that against? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably quite a slow moving Catalina. It's probably a sitting duck, is it? Well, you know, off the top of my head, I mean, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of listeners out there that could probably be more detailed when it comes to the defensive armament of German U boats. But they had a they had a variety of anti aircraft weaponry, more so than the attacking aircraft. I got the impression that I could actually lay down quite a lot of covering fire, which made it quite difficult for these planes coming in. Um, which is not what I sort of thought from a U boat. You know, I didn't, you know didn't really think they had that much anti-aircraft uh, weaponry on board. And that's just naivety on my part. I never really, th- you, know, <laughs> you don't think about these things sometimes, do you, until it's uh, pointed out. The U-boats had a better chance uh, of, of defending itself when there was a single or maybe two aircraft attacking, which occurred quite often, uh, especially during the early stages of World War II. Uh, they had a bigger problem when there was multiple aircraft attacking at the same time, as you can imagine. When they're on patrol, do they radio in? What in, in? Do they operate almost like the wolf packs? Do the the the, 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 the you know, do they they fly out? Someone spots one, and they all rendezvous on rendezvous on target. The planes. Not typically. Uh, if you're talking about land based uh, aircraft operations, no, because it, it happened so quickly. There was not enough time to call in reinforcements. So once reinforcements did arrive. The attack was over. I mean, do we know what kind of um, success rate they have? Because I, 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 you know th- th- that phrase th- 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 is the title of the book. It, you know, subsided, sank, same. Um, it's slightly ironic because turns out the sub wasn't sank. But <laughs> oh, exactly, <laughs> it's a great statement. It's a, it's a great call <laughs> call sign. Well, t- tell us about that. That that. T- Tell us about that subsided sank say where it comes from. Well, it comes from a, a pilot aboard a, a Ventura bomber. His name was Chief Petty Officer Mason. He attacked a submarine, and apparently they thought they had sank the, the submarine and radio back to base, you know, that, that famous statement. 
during that time of, in the war, uh, the U.S. was looking for anything that would promote, you know, patriotism. And, you know, that statement was just blazed across the headlines of every newspaper. And uh, in actuality, the submarine escaped only to be later sunk sometime. Uh, yeah, I think it was sunk later by a U.S. destroyer. But the next one, they actually, uh, his crew actually did sink a submarine. So, you know. Well, it struck, my, my uncle was on the Sunderland flying books from Scotland. Uh, and in all the time that he was uh, flying anti-submarine patrols, they only saw one. And I said, uh, what happened? He said, oh, we dropped a couple of depth charges. I don't think we got it. And that was it. <laughs> I said, he said it was just boring. We just sat there for 12 hours and then, you know, flare them back. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, all the aircraft and all the crews that participated just on the American side of uh, of, of the U-boat war, uh, you know, most of them never saw a thing. Uh, and you're talking, you know, patrols that would last 9 to 12 hours, uh, looking over an entire vast sea of nothingness. So when you look at the overall kill ratio, you know, they, they sank uh, 83 uh, of the what was the number, 170-ish, destroyed by U.S. Air Forces, out of the 700 and somewhat, you know, of, of all U-boats sank, Allied Surface Forces scored a, a lot higher kill ratio. But it was still a significant aspect that that the aircraft may have actually caused U-boats to, to be very careful where they operated, knowing that there, there could be Allied aircraft about. It is a significant number. I mean, it must be... I mean, what struck me as well is, is how... Uh, it's a pretty hostile environment, um, is the Atlantic. You know, you're flying for 12 hours. And if they do have a, uh, a lucky break uh, and actually manage to uh, sink, sink a submarine, did they actually assist the German sailors in, in, the, uh, in the water? If you're talking about the North Atlantic, survivability was practically zero. Uh, you know, hyperthermia, they would be dead within, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And on one occasion, uh, uh, the pilot of one naval aircraft actually machine gunned the survivors in the water. Uh, and as he put it, it's, it's, it's better to die this way quickly than to, to slowly uh, die of uh, hyperthermia. Um, so yes, I mean the, the survivability in the North Atlantic was was you know practically zero, while in the southern waters in the Caribbean and and off of South America, uh, if you managed to get off the U boat in time, uh, there was a higher uh, survivability rate. But uh, once again, not everybody survived. Did, did, did the crews assist them? I, I sort of I wondered if uh, you know if there was any intelligence benefit of uh, you know. Of, of trying to assist them and calling in surface ships to pick them up. Like I said, in the northern waters, there wasn't enough time. Uh, but uh, in the southern areas, yes, U.S. ships and Allied ships would come across and search for survivors and pick them up. And they already knew basically what submarine it was, where they're coming out of, because the you know their intelligence was so good. Basically, it was just to verify what what new boat it was and. And they would actually find out how many patrols it went on and how many ships it sank or, or attacked. So uh, it was pretty much of a clarification in a humanitarian reasons why that they would pick up the, the, the survivors. You, you mentioned the Southern Atlantic there. I mean, the Germans sent commerce raiders into uh, the Southern Atlantic because it's easy picking. So I presume it's the same for the U-boats. Presumably that's a problem for the U.S. because flying from mainland America, you just haven't got that. It's much harder to cover. I mean, I guess it's different in the uh, Caribbean, but could they, could they cover the Southern Atlantic? Well, what happened is that uh, they extended operations throughout the Caribbean. You had naval aircraft operating from Jamaica, Cuba, uh, just about every main uh, island in the Caribbean. By, mm, I would say, late 1942, you had aircraft, the Catalina, the Mariner, and later the PB-4Y, and, the, and then the uh, Ventura, operating from coastal bases in Brazil. And so it extended ranges even further out where they could cover the routes of uh, merchant ships carrying war materials from South America and the Caribbean 
to the eastern seaboard and from the eastern seaboard over to Britain. By mid-1943, they, they, the U.S. had established a, a firm foothold on the entire area from Greenland, Iceland, all the way down to, uh, to Brazil. I wonder if there's, there's certain technological, I don't know if they are breakthroughs, but I, was, I, I made note of them as being breakthroughs, well, they're revolutionary, the acoustic torpedo. I mean, it, 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 is that what we'd call a homing torpedo? <laughs> exactly, yes. Did it work? Oh, yes. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, and it was called different things. It was called Proctor, Zombie, uh, Fido. And it was an acoustical torpedo that would home on the captivation noises of the submarine screws in combination with uh, these acoustic buoys that they would drop uh, as well. And uh, it was used very well and uh, uh, against U-boats from carrier-based aircraft. Uh, the TBM Avenger torpedo bomber that were based on aircraft carriers carried the Sono buoys and the, the torpedo. And quite a number of uh, U-boats were destroyed using those wep- that weapons uh, system. So those sonar buoys, they're they also the magnetic anomaly detection I think, aren't they? Oh, that's different. Uh, uh, Is it? Yes. Uh, the, the, the acoustic uh, buoys would, would home in, or actually they would drop a string of them. From the sound coming from them, the radio operator within the, the torpedo bomber would listen for the, the pinging sound of the screws of the U-boat, whereas the uh, Mad Gear uh, was used by one naval squadron, in particular VP-63, and that actually would just pick up the actually magnetic. Oh, how can I put this? Mm. It basically, it operated as a big giant magnet. <laughs> and when it came across, and, and 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 you know, and submarines are made out of steel, it would give the crew, you know, uh, the the radar slash mad gear operator, the soundings of of, of picking up the steel from the submarine, and uh, they would toss out. Uh, out of the aircraft, uh, smoke bu- smoker buoys, and they usually worked in tandem with British and uh, British Commonwealth uh, warships in the Mediterranean to uh, attack the submarines. We've mentioned a few Allied uh, technological uh, advancements. Did the Germans not develop anything to pick up Allied incoming aircraft, or uh, th- th- they used? Yes, actually, they, the the Germans were. I would say just as advanced in radar technology as the United States and Britain were. Uh, And they installed uh, aircraft detection devices aboard the aircraft and also uh, uh, surface-to-air radar on some of them. Invariably, for one reason or another, and I'm sure there's listeners out there that could pinpoint the exact reasons why, is that they're often not used and, and... you get a sense of that uh, while I was doing my research on the number of German aircraft, uh, German submarines caught on the surface, uh, where you actually had the German crew members, you know, sunbathing on the deck or, or swimming. Uh, I'm assuming because a lot of those submarines you had no survivors is that the 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 systems weren't being monitored, and for some U-boat captains, they actually thought that those systems were actually drawing in. Uh, enemy aircraft which would be i guess would be a fear be an odd fear though you it's a lack of faith in your own technology isn't it <laughs> right well and they didn't understand that uh their codes had been broken you know well <laughs> yes well that's true isn't it when you've got people magically turning up and you're you know, suddenly yeah but you've got impregnable codes you probably blame everything but the impregnable codes I hadn't quite put the two and two together right they never figured out why and it was, it, yeah. you know, it was like hey, why are these uh, aircraft why are these ships right there <laughs> we, blame, <laughs> we could blame it on the newfangled radar right and that's what <laughs> they were doing they're you know it's like okay it was you know aircraft radar uh sonar and yeah, but never under, understanding that it was actually the the device that they were using aboard the submarines. We, 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 you touched upon the uh, on the carriers. It's the Avenger and, and there's Wildcats flying, isn't there? From from carriers, how you know how big? Uh, I mean, the bit, I made a note. That the U.S. built 124 escort carriers between 1942 and 1945, which is you know it's one every couple of weeks. It's it's a staggering staggering number of carriers. Now, I assume a, a large portion of those will be in the Pacific, but um, 
How many are in the Atlantic? What kind of, uh, how big a component were there in the air war against the uh, U-boats? Well, you're talking by the beginning of 1943, uh, you know, you had one carrier and it's it, basically it was a hunter-killer group centered around a, an escort carrier and then uh, destroyer escorts and destroyers. Uh, so they worked with each other. As additional uh, escort carriers became available, they were able to cover a considerable uh, amount of uh, water from, uh, I would say, points off of Africa all the way to uh, points uh, in the North Atlantic. And they had a very high success rate. Presumably they get, get the carriers are bridging that air gap in the middle where the, where the land planes can't get, which, which traditionally the U-boats probably thought they were relatively safe. Right, right. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, sea-based aircraft show up. And uh, so, yes, I, I'm pretty sure they were uh, quite surprised. And here's the thing about, uh, you know, the, the Wildcats and the Avengers is uh, you're talking about aircraft that were equipped with uh, 50 caliber machine guns. Then you had air-to-ground or air-to-sea rockets. Then uh, you had uh, the the TBM Avengers coming along with depth charges and uh, acoustic torpedoes, and uh, the Wildcats were used to st- to suppress any defensive fire coming from the submarine, and then the the Avengers would come in and launch their attack, and then it was like a swarm of, of bees attacking, uh, where you had the Wildcats firing rockets and and machine gun fire. And the TBMs coming in and dropping depth charges or acoustic torpedoes. Did the Allies shift their tactics as the war went on? Are they, by, you know, by the close of the war, are they sort of doing the same things they were doing in you know 1940, or are they shifted the way they they deployed their aircraft? I look at it as 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 it evolving. I mean, you know, the tactics and the uh, uh, the technology available. Uh, where, you know, at the beginning of World War II, uh, it was all by eyes and by, uh, you know, binoculars uh, from aircraft. By the time the war ended, uh, I mean, in May 1945, you had hundred killer groups ranging across in pretty much the entire middle and North Atlantic. You had land-based aircraft covering uh, points from Iceland down to uh, Brazil and uh, Ascension Island. There were other aircraft based out of the Azores. And and with that, you had the aircraft, and you had a, a very uh, high level of, uh, of teamwork with uh, surface forces and air forces and operations from land bases, uh, where you had a coordinated effort using what was considered the most advanced technology mm. at the time. What surprised me was that what seemed like an obvious thing, but is you know is also sort of blocking off the Bay of Biscay, where you've got those French U-boat bases, and you've got this choke point that they can now effectively hem in from all sides with bases everywhere and presumably carriers at sea. It's amazing that you know, but pretty much by off the top of my head, by by nineteen forty four mid to late 1944, uh, it was almost a death sentence for a U-boat crew to venture out just because of what they were facing uh, with allied surface forces and air forces. The, the, the survivability was very, very low at that time. And, of course, those U-boat crews weren't told this. You, but they had a sense because when they did go back through their home base, uh, there was quite a few people missing. Yeah, yeah, but presumably the... Uh... The fitters and the mechanics who uh, are at shore in harbour would would keep track of who's who's not coming back. Which I was was sort of brings U five or five. It must be one of the most well known U uh, boats that's captured, especially this newsreel. I, I used to have a sixty mil uh, newsreel of it being captured, and it's now in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, which I have visited. And annoyingly, I arrived too late in the day to get a trip through the U boats. So I could only go round it. Um, how is it? How do you capture a submarine? <laughs> how do you capture a submarine that was sort of blowing it out of the water? Well, what it was is that uh, that hundred killer group went out with the intention of capturing a, a, a submarine. Uh, that was their goal. So what they did is they they coordinated with the, uh, you know the air assets aboard the carrier. 
uh, combined with the service forces is they pretty much uh, almost like, well, in Texas, it would be kind of like lassoing a, a, a cattle. Basically, they just formed a line and uh, surrounded, you know, because they knew exactly where the submarine was, you know, based upon their technology that they had. And they and they would launch attacks, hoping that their 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 depth charges would not severely damage the submarine, but enough to basically damage it slightly, uh, and or uh, scare the crew to basically you know we can't survive this attack. And so they surfaced. They had every intention of scuttling the the U boat, but the away party uh, arrived. Uh, quicker than they could uh, set off any demolition charges or anything. And the submarine was in a sinking state, but they managed to uh, kept it from sinking. The information of its capture was, uh, you know, was never told to the public in the United States or anywhere else. And so the, the Germans had the belief that it had been sunk with the entire crew. It was such a, stop, a top secret event that... Uh, Hundreds of men that participated in it in the in the hunter killer group were told that uh, this is top secret and you, you could not divulge anything that occurred until after the war. Presumably, the fear is that they don't want the Germans to know that they've captured anything and got possibly got their code books. Right, and if they knew that they, they had captured a submarine, they could pretty much assure that the, that their codes had been compromised. And, uh, you know, it would have been a different uh, end result there for a while. Yeah, another, yeah which would have effect, potentially affected Ultra. And anyway, finally, this sounds a bit nuts, but there's also Japanese submarines at the Atlantic, in the Atlantic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> isn't there? And Italian. And Italian. Well, they're, they're not as surprising as the Japanese. <laughs> well, the Japanese in, 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 in Germany, uh, you know, were allies. The purpose was to share technology and to uh, uh, supply either side with materials that the other lacked thereof. They would send along technical technicians, and they were aboard the submarines, and they would go to either Japan or vice versa. It was pretty much of an information exchange along with uh, materials. Of course, the United States Navy knew about it. They had already broken... Uh, the Japanese naval codes, and along with the German naval codes, so they, they pretty much figured out exactly when and where the submarines were coming from, and where their destinations point were, and uh, and and that's what happened to the I-52. They were carrying uh, uh, German technicians aboard, I do believe, a considerable amount of opium, supposedly gold bullion, and everything. A uh, hundred killer group. Uh, was launched, and uh, an Avenger torpedo bomber uh, dropped a series of sono buoys and located the submarine and dropped a, a acoustic torpedo. And uh, what's interesting is that you could actually hear the recording that, that was actually made during the attack. You could actually hear the, the, the noise of the submarine's uh, screws, and then you can actually hear the torpedo hitting and the, uh, uh, the sound of water escaping from inside the submarine. And this was 1944, which, you know, was pretty remarkable for the day. Well, we've got to 1944. That seems to be a good place to finish. Thanks, Alan. Loyal listener, if you want to know more, the book is Sighted Sub Sank Same, the United States Navy Air Campaign Against the U-Boat. I will, as ever put a link to it on the website www2podcast.com well that is it for this episode i'm angus wallace and thanks for listening